It was the summer of 2019 when my friends and I embarked on a road trip through the heart of rural America. Our group consisted of me, Jason, his girlfriend Emily, and our buddy Tom. We had all just graduated college and decided to celebrate our newfound freedom by exploring off-the-beaten-path destinations. Little did we know, this trip would take us down a road that none of us would ever forget. We were driving through an isolated stretch of highway in Kansas, the vast fields of wheat swaying gently in the evening breeze. The sun had just set, and the sky was painted in hues of orange and pink. As night fell, an eerie stillness settled over the landscape. The only sound was the hum of our car engine as we cruised down the empty road. Guys, look up ahead, Jason said, pointing to a figure standing by the roadside. As we drew closer, we saw it was a man, his thumb out, clearly hitchhiking. Should we stop? Emily asked, her voice tinged with apprehension. It's pretty late, Tom said, glancing at me. But he might need help. We can't just leave him here. I nodded in agreement, and Jason slowed the car to a stop. The hitchhiker approached, his face hidden in the shadows of his hood. He seemed out of place in the desolate landscape, but there was something about him that made me uneasy. Where are you headed? Jason asked, rolling down the window. Just up the road a bit, the man replied, his voice calm and steady. Thank you for stopping. It's a long walk to the nearest town. We shuffled around to make room for him, and he climbed into the back seat next to Tom. As we resumed our journey, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off about our new passenger. My name's Sam, the hitchhiker said, breaking the silence. I appreciate the ride. It's not often you find kind souls willing to help a stranger these days. No problem, Jason replied, trying to sound casual. We were just headed that way anyway. As we drove, Sam began to tell us stories about the local area, his voice taking on a haunting quality. He spoke of ghostly apparitions seen in the fields, of abandoned houses where the spirits of the past still lingered, and of a legend that sent chills down our spines. Have you ever heard of the phantom hitchhiker? Sam asked, his eyes glinting in the rearview mirror. No, Emily said, leaning forward. What's that? It's an old legend around these parts. Sam explained. They say a long time ago, a young woman was hitchhiking on this very road. She was picked up by a group of friends much like yourselves. But something terrible happened that night. The car crashed, and the young woman died. Ever since then, her spirit has been wandering these roads looking for a ride. They say if you pick her up, you'll never reach your destination. A shiver ran down my spine and I glanced at my friends. They all looked uneasy, but we tried to laugh it off. That's just a story, right? Tom said, though his voice lacked conviction. Who knows? Sam replied with a shrug. Some stories have a way of becoming real if you believe in them enough. We continued driving, the atmosphere in the car growing tenser with each passing mile. The darkness outside seemed to close in on us and the road stretched on endlessly. Suddenly the car's headlights flickered and the engine sputtered. What's happening? Emily asked panic creeping into her voice. I don't know, Jason replied, pulling the car over to the side of the road. I'll check under the hood. We all got out, the night air cool and silent. Jason popped the hood and began inspecting the engine, while the rest of us stood by, feeling increasingly unnerved. Everything looks fine, Jason said, frustration in his voice. I don't understand why it just stopped. Sam stood a few feet away, staring down the road. Maybe it's the curse of the phantom hitchhiker, he said softly. Come on, man, Tom said, his voice shaking. That's just a story. Sam turned to face us, his expression unreadable. Is it? Or maybe you're living it right now. Before we could respond, we heard a faint sound in the distance, a woman's voice calling for help. It sent a chill through my bones and we all turned to look down the road. Did you hear that? Emily whispered. Yeah, Jason replied, his eyes wide. What the hell was that? The voice grew louder, more desperate, and we saw a figure emerging from the darkness. It was a young woman, her clothes torn and dirty, her face pale and frightened. Please, help me, she cried, stumbling towards us. I need help. Get in the car, Jason shouted, slamming the hood shut. 
We all scrambled back into the car, our hearts racing. The engine roared to life and we sped off, leaving the woman behind. What the hell just happened? Tom asked, his voice trembling. Did we just see a ghost? Emily whispered, clutching my arm. I don't know, I replied, my mind racing, but we need to get out of here. As we drove, the atmosphere in the car grew even more tense. Sam remained silent, his gaze fixed on the road ahead. The temperature seemed to drop, and I could see my breath in the air. Guys, look, Jason said, pointing to the rearview mirror. The woman was running after the car, her expression one of desperation and terror. She's following us, Emily screamed. How is that possible? Drive faster, Tom shouted. We need to lose her. But no matter how fast we drove, the woman kept pace, her image growing clearer in the mirror. The air inside the car felt suffocating, and the fear was palpable. Why won't she stop? I yelled, my voice cracking. Because you picked up the phantom hitchhiker, Sam said quietly, his eyes meeting mine in the mirror. And now you're part of the story. You're insane, Jason shouted. This can't be happening. Suddenly the car veered off the road, skidding to a stop in a ditch. The impact jolted us and we scrambled to get out, our breaths coming in ragged gasps. The woman was nowhere to be seen, but the sense of dread remained. What do we do now? Emily asked, tears streaming down her face. We need to keep moving, Sam said, his voice calm. There's a town not far from here. We can find help there. We followed Sam down the road, the darkness closing in around us. The silence was deafening, and every shadow seemed to hide some unseen terror. As we walked, Sam continued to tell us stories, his voice a haunting echo in the night. They say the phantom hitchhiker is cursed to wander these roads forever he said, always searching for a ride, always leading those who pick her up to their doom. Why are you telling us this? I asked, my fear turning to anger. What are you trying to prove? I'm trying to help you, Sam replied. But you have to believe me. The only way to break the curse is to confront it head on. What do you mean? Tom asked, his voice shaking. We have to go back, Sam said, his eyes dark and serious. We have to face her. No way. Jason said, shaking his head. I'm not going back there. We don't have a choice, Sam insisted. If we keep running, she'll keep following us. The only way to end this is to face her. Reluctantly, we agreed. We turned back, our hearts heavy with dread. The road seemed even darker and more menacing than before, and the cold seeped into our bones. As we approached the spot where we had first seen the woman, the air grew colder and the sense of dread intensified. The woman appeared again, standing in the middle of the road, her eyes filled with sorrow. Please help me, she whispered, her voice carrying on the wind. We're here to help, Sam said, stepping forward. Tell us what you need. The woman's expression softened and she pointed to the side of the road. My body is there she said, buried under the dirt. Please give me a proper burial. We followed her directions, digging into the cold earth until we uncovered her remains. As we laid her bones to rest, the air grew warmer and the sense of dread lifted. Thank you, the woman said, her voice a soft echo. I can finally rest. As her spirit faded, we felt a sense of peace wash over us. The curse had been broken, and the phantom hitchhiker was no more. We returned to our car, the engine starting without a hitch. The drive to the nearest town was uneventful, the terror of the night slowly fading into memory. As we sat in a diner, sipping hot coffee and trying to make sense of what had happened, Sam looked at us with a knowing smile. Some stories have a way of becoming real if you believe in them enough, he said. But sometimes confronting them is the only way to find peace. We never saw Sam again after that night. He disappeared without a trace, leaving us to wonder if he had been a part of the legend all along. But one thing was certain. We would never forget the night we picked up the phantom hitchhiker and lived to tell the tale. The coastal retreat was supposed to be a peaceful escape from the hustle and bustle of city life. My friends and I had rented a quaint little cottage by the sea, eager to spend a week relaxing on the beach, exploring the rugged cliffs and soaking in the natural beauty. 
The town of Blackwater Bay was small and charming, with friendly locals and an air of tranquility that was a welcome change from our hectic routines. On our second day, we decided to venture further along the coastline. As we hiked along the rocky path, we came across an old abandoned lighthouse standing forlornly at the edge of a cliff. Its once white paint was now peeling and weathered, the windows dark and lifeless. Look at that, Sarah said, pointing at the lighthouse. It's so eerie. We should check it out. Are you sure? Mike replied, glancing at the structure with a mix of curiosity and apprehension. It looks pretty run down. It's probably fine, I said, feeling a strange pull towards the lighthouse. Besides, what's the worst that could happen? We made our way to the lighthouse, the wind whipping through our hair and the sound of crashing waves filling the air. As we got closer, I noticed a faded plaque near the entrance. It read, Blackwater Lighthouse, established 1875. The door creaked loudly as we pushed it open, revealing a dimly lit interior. Dust motes floated in the air, and the smell of salt and decay was overwhelming. The main room was cluttered with old furniture, scattered papers, and broken equipment. In one corner, a spiral staircase led up to the lantern room. Let's go upstairs, Sarah suggested, already heading for the staircase. We followed her, the steps groaning under our weight. The lantern room was surprisingly intact, with large windows offering a panoramic view of the ocean. The massive Fresnel lens stood in the center, a relic of a bygone era. This place is amazing, Mike said, looking around in awe. Can you imagine what it was like to work here? As we stood there, admiring the view, something strange happened. The air grew heavy and a feeling of unease settled over us. The room seemed to grow colder, and I could hear the faint sound of a foghorn in the distance, even though there was no fog. Do you hear that? Sarah asked, her voice barely above a whisper. Yeah, I replied, my heart pounding. It's probably just the wind. But deep down, I knew it was something more. The atmosphere in the room had shifted, and I felt an inexplicable sense of dread. We decided to leave, but as we made our way back down the staircase, the first hallucination hit me. I was no longer in the lighthouse. Instead, I found myself on a ship, caught in the midst of a violent storm. The waves were monstrous, crashing over the deck and threatening to pull the vessel under. Sailors screamed and scrambled to secure the rigging, their faces contorted with fear. Help! We're going to sink! One of them shouted, his voice barely audible over the roar of the storm. I could feel the cold spray of the sea, the lurching of the ship beneath my feet, and the terror in my chest. Just as a massive wave loomed over the ship, everything went black, and I was back in the lighthouse gasping for breath. What the hell just happened? I muttered, clutching the railing for support. Did you see that too? Mike asked, his face pale. See what? Sarah said, looking between us with concern. A shipwreck, I replied, still trying to process what I'd experienced. It felt so real. Sarah shook her head. I didn't see anything. We hurried out of the lighthouse, the oppressive feeling following us. As we walked back to the cottage, I couldn't shake the image of the storm and the drowning sailors. That night, I had trouble sleeping. The hallucination had been so vivid, so real, that it left me deeply unsettled. The next day, we decided to explore the town and see if we could learn more about the lighthouse. At the local library, we found old newspaper clippings and records that told the story of Blackwater Lighthouse. The lighthouse had been built in 1875 to guide ships safely through the treacherous waters around Blackwater Bay. It had been manned by a series of keepers, but one name stood out, Arthur Lynch. He had served as the lighthouse keeper for nearly three decades, until his tragic death in 1903. According to the records, Lynch had been a dedicated and meticulous keeper, but his tenure had been marred by a series of devastating shipwrecks. Despite his best efforts, numerous vessels had floundered in the bay, claiming countless lives. The final blow came when his own son, a sailor, perished in a shipwreck during a fierce storm. Devastated by grief and guilt, Lynch had taken his own life in the lighthouse. That's awful, Sarah said, reading the account. No wonder the place feels haunted. Do you think his spirit is still there? Mike asked, a note of unease in his voice. I don't know, I replied, shivering at the thought. 
but it feels like something is. Determined to understand what was happening, we decided to return to the lighthouse that evening, armed with flashlights and a sense of trepidation. As we approached, the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows over the cliff. Inside, the atmosphere was even more oppressive than before. The air was thick with a sense of foreboding, and the sound of the distant foghorn seemed to echo through the walls. We made our way to the lantern room, our footsteps echoing on the metal steps. As we stood in the lantern room, the hallucinations returned with a vengeance. This time, all three of us were affected. I found myself reliving the shipwreck, the terror and chaos amplified by the knowledge that I couldn't change the outcome. Sarah experienced the drowning of a group of fishermen, their desperate cries for help echoing in her ears. Mike saw a young woman being swept overboard, her face frozen in a silent scream. We snapped back to reality, gasping for breath, our hearts racing. The visions had been so intense, so vivid, that it was impossible to dismiss them as mere hallucinations. We need to leave, Sarah said, her voice shaking. This place is cursed. As we hurried down the stairs, we heard a low, mournful moan that seemed to come from the very walls of the lighthouse. The sound grew louder, more insistent, as if something was trying to communicate with us. Wait, I said, stopping in my tracks. What if it's Arthur Lynch? What if he's trying to tell us something? Are you crazy? Mike replied, his eyes wide with fear. We need to get out of here. But something compelled me to stay. I turned and headed back up the stairs, my friends reluctantly following. In the lantern room, I focused on the sound, trying to decipher its meaning. Arthur, I called out, my voice echoing in the empty room. If you're here, show us a sign. The room grew colder, and the foghorn's moan seemed to morph into words, barely audible but unmistakable. Help! Them! Help who? Sarah asked, her voice trembling. The answer came in another wave of visions. This time we saw Arthur Lynch himself standing in the lantern room, his face etched with sorrow and despair. He pointed towards the sea, where the ghostly images of shipwrecked sailors and drowning victims appeared, their faces twisted in agony. He's trapped, I said, understanding dawning on me. He can't rest because he feels responsible for all those deaths. We have to do something, Sarah said, her fear giving way to determination. We have to help him. But how could we help a restless spirit find peace? The answer came to me in a flash of inspiration. We needed to perform a ceremony to honor the dead and acknowledge their suffering. Maybe that would give Lynch the closure he needed. We gathered what we could from the lighthouse and the surrounding area, candles, matches, and an old journal we found among the scattered papers. The journal belonged to Lynch and contained entries detailing his guilt and grief over the shipwrecks. We returned to the lantern room and arranged the candles in a circle, placing the journal in the center. As we lit the candles, we recited a prayer for the dead, asking for their forgiveness and peace. The air grew colder, and the room filled with a soft, ethereal light. The ghostly figures of the shipwrecked sailors and drowning victims appeared once more, their faces now calm and serene. Arthur Lynch stood among them, his expression one of gratitude and relief. Thank you, he whispered, his voice like a sigh on the wind. Thank you for setting us free. The figures slowly faded, the light dimming until we were left standing in the dim glow of the candles. The oppressive atmosphere had lifted replaced by a sense of peace and tranquility. We left the lighthouse, the weight of its tragic history no longer pressing down on us. As we walked back to the cottage, we felt a sense of accomplishment and closure. We had faced the darkness and emerged stronger for it. In the days that followed, we shared our experience with the locals, who were both fascinated and grateful. The legend of the haunted lighthouse became a part of Blackwater Bay's history, a testament to the power of compassion and understanding. And as for us, we returned to our lives, forever changed by the events of that fateful night. The memories of the hallucinations and the spirits we encountered would stay with us, a haunting reminder of the thin veil between the living and the dead. But most importantly, 
We knew that we had helped bring peace to those who had suffered, their voices no longer lost to the winds and waves. And in the end, that was all that mattered. I never believed in superstitions, not until the night we ventured into the old Hartfield Glass Factory. The place was notorious in our small town, shrouded in tales of tragic accidents and strange occurrences that supposedly led to its closure. When Tyler proposed we explore it on the eve of its demolition, curiosity got the better of me. The moon was a thin crescent, barely casting light over the dilapidated structure as we squeezed through a gap in the fence. The air inside was thick with dust and the smell of decay. Our flashlights danced over broken machinery and piles of discarded glass, creating eerie reflections and long, distorted shadows. Check this out! Emily called from a corner of the vast room. We gathered around a heap of glass shards larger and more intact than the rest. Strangely, each piece still reflected like a well-polished mirror. Tyler, ever the ringleader, dared us to stand over the shards and look at our reflections. I hesitated, a chill running down my spine as I stepped forward. The glass under my feet clicked and shifted, and I froze, looking down. My shadow, cast by the flashlight, seemed sharper than usual, etched deeply into the glass as if it were part of it. A sudden fear gripped me. Guys, I think we should go, I said. Don't be a coward, it's just old glass. Tyler laughed, but his mockery stopped when he stepped onto the glass. His shadow, like mine, looked unnaturally crisp. Then, without warning, his shadow seemed to sink into the glass. Tyler yelped, jumping back, but it was too late. His shadow was gone. What the hell? He stammered, looking around wildly as if he might find it lying on the floor. Emily tried to move closer to him, but her own shadow stretched towards the glass and then snapped back to her like a rubber band. That's not normal, Tyler. We need to leave. Now! I urged. But our group was frozen in disbelief, watching the bizarre phenomena unfold. As we debated, a deep, groaning sound echoed through the building, and the temperature dropped sharply. The glass pieces began to vibrate, emitting a low, humming noise. Our shadows flickered wildly, as though struggling against an unseen force. Panic set in, and we scrambled towards the exit, but as we moved, I felt a tug at my feet. Looking down in horror, I saw my shadow tearing away from me, absorbed by the hungry glass. Screaming, I managed to break free, but I felt different, less substantial, as if part of my essence had been stripped away. We burst out into the night air, gasping, disoriented, and incomplete. Our shadows were either gone or fractured, mere fragments of what they had been. As we huddled together, the reality of our situation dawned on us. We have to get them back. Emily whispered, her voice trembling. We're not whole without them. The decision to return was unanimous but filled with dread. Armed with ropes and salt, folk remedies, desperate grasps at protection, we re-entered the factory. The glass now seemed alive, pulsating with a dark energy as if fed by our fears. We approached the central pile where we'd lost our shadows, forming a circle around it. On three, Grab a piece and don't let go, no matter what happens, Tyler instructed, his voice barely hiding his fear. One, two, three. We each grabbed a shard, and the world turned chaotic. Shadows surged from the glass, writhing and twisting in the air before slamming back into us. The pain was excruciating, as if our very souls were being stitched back together. When the turmoil subsided, we collapsed, exhausted but whole. Our shadows were intact moving as they should with our bodies. We left the factory quickly, vowing never to speak of that night again. Now, as I write this, the factory has been reduced to rubble. But sometimes, in the dead of night, I feel a chill, and I wonder if the shadows we took back were truly ours, or something else entirely. In the darkness, I see glimpses of movements that are not my own, and I fear that what we encountered at Hartfield was something far older and more malevolent than we could have ever imagined. And I fear it hasn't finished with us yet. <laughs>